Okay. So, <coughs> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning to online participants. We are starting the uh, third day of our ad seventh advanced uh, in silico drug design workshop. And today it will be everything about the structure-based methods. And I will be starting with uh, a lecture on alphaphology and then Federica Moraka from Junia, from uh, Napoli, will continue with molecular design and molecular docking. And then uh, afterwards, uh, after the lunch, we will have tutorial on molecular docking and then tutorial by Alexandra Ivanova from uh, Pavel Polischuk group uh, on molecular dynamics and how to connect that with, uh, with docking. So, uh, with saying that, I think we can start with the lecture. And uh, I will be speaking about alpha foldology. And I'm speaking about alpha foldology because uh, the, alpha fo the, the event of alpha fold basically made a machine learning revolution in structural biology and it's growing and growing and growing. So, <coughs> yeah. uh, when it came up, it was, there were plenty of, uh, of those uh, titles like it will change everything and, and so on and everyone was really enthusiastic and I must say that the movement in the field of structural biology and, uh, is tremendous since then. Uh, and the reason is that when we know the function, when we know the structure of the protein, we can find out the important parts about the function much better than just taking from the sequence. And now when we have capabilities to sequence almost anything, <coughs> Now we can use this large trove of data from almost all organisms and we have complete sequence of, of the human and so on that we can transfer that for the structures of almost any protein now. Uh, the problem with the protein structures, uh, experimental ones, is that uh, their obtaining is quite expensive when you still. And uh, while the sequences, there is an order of difference between how much structures we have and how much sequences we have. Okay. So for that reason, if we want to work in structure-based design on structural biology, then any prediction method that would take the, the sequences and make the model of which would be almost as good as the experimental structure would be and was quite tremendous. Uh, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Christian Anfinsen, basically found out that the sequence is necessary to have the, the specific structure because he was able to unfold and refold the same protein and therefore oh, it was done that the amino acids are the sole requirement for the function then. Therefore, the structure coming from the sequence is what is taking the, the, the function of the protein. And for that reason, the methods for protein uh, prediction of the structures are among here since 80s, let's say. And they are, so they are better and better. And there were multiple different, uh, different ways how to do this. And uh, one of the most successful previously was homology modeling, where you had some protein of unknown structure, but you knew that uh, it was highly homologous to some template for which you knew the structure. And from this, we were able to obtain the structural model. And this was quite useful, and it's still useful if you have something really similar and you just looked for the effect of mutations and everything. But quite a lot of sequences are quite different to the known structures. So for those uh, proteins, this approach wasn't working. But afterwards, uh, the next approach was basically trying to interfere and use the power of evolution to basically find out the correlations between multiple sequence alignment and how these 
pairs were interacting and cor correlated together, then f therefore if they were changing together, there might be somehow sim uh, in similar place and therefore it made some kind of constraints and those constraints were then used for the model building. This approach helped, but it was not good enough uh, in a sense that they, it still did not produce a really good models sort of out of that. So, the <coughs> but there was additional point which was necessary and that was the uh, some kind of a uh, <coughs> assessment that would help to feel to move forward, to find out which method actually works and which doesn't. And John Mould uh, started with the critical assessment of protein structure prediction every two years in 1994, so quite a long time ago. And it was transparent competition where experimentalists were asked to basically postpone the publication of their structures. And the, s the predictors ju were just given the sequences. And from this, the, the predictors were making the models. And then those models were compared to the real experimental structure and how well each group was working and how well the individual programs were working, that was making the output of the CASP. So the CASP <coughs> basically came up with the way how to compare the experimental and, uh, uh, and predicted structure by comparing uh, this, uh, this global distance test and that was the test where it uh, each alpha, each atom was taken from the model and from the uh, from the target, from the experiment, uh, to see whether they are either within one extreme, two extremes, four extremes, or eight extremes. And this value for each amino acids was then averaged over all uh, amino acids within the protein. So it's a relatively robust test because it will t uh, it tells whether we are really catching the the shape of the protein with every little detail, and it's if you are down here, you still can get some kind of a general shape, let's say, but if you are going upward here to 100, basically you are your model will be indistinguishable from the uh, from the experiment. And here you can see uh, that the targets uh, coming from the easy ones, which had the high homology to something, to quite difficult one, which was larger proteins and no, no known homology, were quite different that this homology modeling was quite successful, even at the beginning, at the first CASP. But then the last part, the, the difficult targets were really, really bad. But in this area, there was a small movement upwards. But then you can see that the, la the several casps, like this, from, let's say, uh, from this green one, which is casp 6 to casp, casp 12, there was not much of uh, increase of, uh, in the prediction value. So there, basically, there, was, there were several questionnaires whether it's actually worth it to run another cast because the field is not moving forward. But then, in 2018, AlphaFold 1 entered the, the, the competition and it was here. So huge improvements even for the difficult targets. But at the time, it was closed surf, surf, closed surf uh, software which was developed by DeepMind and it was unaccessible to any uh, uh, to any researcher in academia, uh, and it was just used by DeepMind, so it was completely closed. And uh, the scientists were quite angry about that because <coughs> it's nice to s to see here that there is some kind of a tool that could be quite useful, but if I can't use it, it's worthwhile, worthless for me, basically. But from the glimpse of what, uh, what was known about how, in principle, it works, in 2020, 
AlphaFold 2 entered the competition and it was even better. But one thing which is quite funny is that Cast 14 without AlphaFold 2 was better than uh, the Cast previous uh, the, the previous Cast. So the field of academics basically catch up with the AlphaFold 1, but not with AlphaFold 2 at that time. And there was another move, and that was that AlphaFold 2 is actually cheaper to run than AlphaFold 1. So they released the open sourced, uh, they open sourced it, and now you can run AlphaFold on multiple locations, and I will show it. So how good and bad predictions look like? On the left side, you can see a good prediction, and frankly speaking, I don't know which of those is experimental and which one is predicted model, because you can't tell, really. In the other case, this is the worst prediction from AlphaFold at that cusp. And you can say that it's really bad prediction because it did not catch this movement and this movement. But other than that, the structure is quite nice. So it really looked like that we have the prediction which is working for everything. But, uh, and since then, uh, last year there was another CASP, and uh, the last CASP basically shown that uh, the field catched up with AlphaFold. So now there is plenty of variants of AlphaFold-like models which are working on it, and there are some models which are not that good as AlphaFold, but they are much cheaper. So you can basically use them to generate the structures uh, basically on the fly, and that was quite large uh, movement as well. It's true only for proteins for now. We don't have yet the structures of nucleic acids, and uh, we don't have the predictions of the ligand places at that level of accuracy as well. So how do alpha fold actually work? Alpha fold takes the input sequence and then do two things. The first one is to do the, uh, the database uh, search to generate the multiple sequence alignment. It needs to find at least 30 and in optimal 50 to 100 sequ other sequ sequences that are in the database in order to gen generate these uh, correlations. Then on another thing is that it does sparing, and that's where it's uh, where it's looking for the previous models and previous structures that uh, that were distilled from the PDB database and from the high confidence alpha fold models as well. Then it mixes them together in the module called Evoformer where basically it tries to find out what is the best combination between this multiple sequence alignment and the pairing to generate one single representation for the sequence and tuned up pair representation that basically says what should be the distances between individual amino acids. And then the structure module basically use this information in order to generate the structure and tune it and then, then the last and quite nice part of the alpha fold is that it provides uh, also a scoring function, PIDDTD, which is predicted value of how good the model would be at that specific point, at that specific amino acid. And therefore, you can see which parts of the structures have high and low confidence. And therefore, you can take those with high confidence and start to build from them again. So it's iterative process that basically makes these things together. And at the end, you will come up with the 3D structure. Uh, multiple sequence alignment is done by common resources using Jack Hammer and HHBlitz. And it's using quite huge databases like big fantastic database you know, of 2.2 protein sequences and the quality uh, of the model really depends on how many sequences you have 
And this is also used, uh, as I will show you later, when we are trying to generate multiple conformers or out of the uh, out of the alpha fold. The training was done on PDB database, and the major part, which is quite nice about PDB database, that it's completely free and fair database because all structures of all proteins which we have known experimentally and they were published in some papers, they are there. So thankfully to 50 years of uh, data curation of those data, we now have really a good base true on which we can make the prediction models. And uh, the combination is done also multiple places. And one thing which is quite clever as well is the usage of tri triangles, not only pairs, but triangles, to basically come up with the more precise distances in between individual amino acids coming from the multiple sequence alignment by basically making this triangle inequalities that shows that, okay, these two pairs are somehow somewhere, so how the last pair compared to it? Yeah. So this helps to make the structure self-sufficient and useful. And the structure model basically works in a way that <coughs> it first find out the position of the, uh, of the main chains, but uh, as a floating points in the space, let's say. And only afterwards, when this, this part is done, only afterwards it, uh, trans it connects individual amino acids and then, uh, then make it for the final refinement by molecular dynamic simulation using Amber Force field. So it's quite different from the homology mo modeling because in homology modeling we basically first use the C alpha of the target and then we are making changes on that. And therefore, we are more stuck in the, into the structure of that specific template than here where we are free to make changes. Uh, it's interesting that since the structures were taught on top of the experimental proteins, which were not just the protein, but also something inside the proteins, uh, it quite often works quite nicely for heterotropic proteins where you have the contact with something else. And if that contact is known, then, of course, the alpha fold model can cover it as well. But another point was quite strong, and that's the advent of alpha fold database. Alpha fold database is run at the ABI as well, at, uh, at the group of Protein Data Bank as well. And uh, this database contains basically every protein sequence which is coming from the either uh, model, organi model organisms, let's say human, or from the proteins uh, from the uh, global health proteomes, so far some bacteria and so on. And the last and the largest part that is completely uh, made all of the structures for the SwissProt part. So for all those <coughs> sequences which were curated by Uniprot in a SwissProt part package, basically all are there. So you can see that there is more than 200 million sequences that have been changed into the structures. So currently, the easiest way how to reach the structure is basically to look into AlphaFold database and get the structure from there. How the structures look like. So this is the uh, one of the transcription uh, transcriptional activation uh, protein, and uh, here we can see by the coloring the quality of the model. One good thing about this is that uh, this is coming from the structural point of view, whether the structure at that spot is good or not, but it also secondary says which parts will be rigid because those ones which are rigid are also the best best described so the dark blue says that this helix will be here this part of the helix which is a little bit uh, uh, lighter blue is probably a little bit moving 
and those <coughs> and other parts of the structures which are yellow, these ones are the, the, the part of the structures which are actually moving a lot. So <coughs> if you look into several structures in, P, uh, in AlphaFold database, you can find that basically it resembles a little bit ball, ball, meatballs with spaghetti around them. And those spaghettis are basically the, the parts of the structure which are nest unstructured, therefore there are some kind of movement, but it is not that it will look like uh, this spaghetti in reality. It's that it's unstructured, so it can make changes according to the environment, and therefore we cannot say any one specific structure would be attainable to this, this plot. And, but we can say that from the, uh, from the color and from the value of PLLDT. Another thing which is quite important there is the alignment of the res residues there, which tells us which residue is known with the interactions with any other. And that helps us to divide the structure into individual domains which are well described and maybe those domains are moving against each other. But we don't see, for instance, part of how this and this will be oriented against each other. This is not a ground true. This is just that this part will look like this, this part will look like this, but since there are hinges that are moving and movable, there will be multiple possibilities how those domains can be interacting to each other. <coughs> and if we compare the whole human proteome, then uh, it's quite funny to see that uh, quite a huge majority of the resolved structures, which were already in protein data bank before the alpha fold, basically most of them were quite nice with high uh, PLLDT, so quite nicely structured. Those which, which we did not have resolved in PDB had quite a lot of uncertainties here and low PLDDDs. So they were moving, they did not have any specific structure. And if we take whole human, basically the human from 60% is quite structured, but these last 30% really is quite unstructured, interestingly disordered part of the proteins. And in some cases, uh, the sequences which are in the, P in the uh, PDB, uh, in AlphaFold database, can be a problematic. So here is a structure of human cytochrome B452C9, and this is the another sequence which is there for a putative cytochrome P uh, P450. And while this one really looks like how a common cytochrome B450 should look like, this one does not share the, the right shape of the cytochrome B450 cavity. So it's really important to see that the structure can be only as good as it's the sequence which we are putting there. So really the sequence and the quality of the sequence starts to be quite, quite important for this. So where you can run it? One of the most popular options is using Google Colab environment and basically running it via Colab fold and there are multiple different uh, possibilities and different value variants of the alpha fold and let's say Rosetta fold from the competitors from David Baker lab that can be run there. Uh, we can run alpha fold also here in Czech Republic using the resources from Elixir and uh, it's possible to find out the, how to run it in Metacentrum at the wiki of Metacentrum. Currently, uh, the uh, A -infra, uh, infrastructure of Czech Republic also included the cloud A infra that allows to run the AlphaFold to predictions. It's possible to run the AlphaFold at uh, use Galaxy AU and Colab Fault is currently available there as well. And here is just one, uh, one additional trick how to make dimer pro proteins. 
because previously the dimer proteins from alpha fold multimer was not really working well. But one thing which was relatively well usable was basically uh, adding a poly N chains in between those dimer dimer parts. And these ones basically as a poly N is IDP. It's unstructured because it's quite polar polar residue. So it was possible to find out how these domains are interacting to each other by these faking uh, faking sequences. And as you can see, this is the uh, typical galaxy uh, galaxy environment. But currently, it's also possible that you don't want to go to a page by yourself, but you want to work within the Chimera or PyMol. And for instance, in Pi Chimera, there is possibility to basically fetch from the AlphaFold database or to use the AlphaFold collab fold to predict the, the AlphaFold structure for your given sequence. So even within those, it is possible. So what are the limitations? The first the limitation is uh, that while the individual domains is done by AlphaFold quite well, multimers by default were not that great, uh, but it, this this part is moving forward with, as we have now a several version of AlphaFold multimer, and there are multiple variants. So now it's starting to make a progress in this. Uh, and we've spoken a lot about uh, how good it is for docking. And here is one of the pre uh, one of the predictor where we can dock uh, into either the experimentally uh, experimental structure or to the AlphaFold 2 or traditional homology model. And you can see that while AlphaFold is better than a homology model per se, it's still better to use the experimental structure for prediction via docking. This is using Vina. Uh, but that's only part of the true. Because this is good, uh, this is true for the retro retrospective uh, results. When you have the crystal structure and you make the alpha fold and you are comparing, then in that case, the alpha fold is quite often the, the less offered, less, less good, uh, less good uh, variant. In case when you don't have anything and you are making prospective, it will be the other way around. But the alpha fold is, was just a start. And currently, there are 267 papers in this year only, which is mentioning alpha fold, according to European PMC. And we are at the end of January. So there is quite a lot of fuss about alpha fold. So, uh, but. Does that mean that we don't need experimentalists at all and now we can run everything in computer? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> uh, because there is still plenty of things which we, don't, which we don't have the information about. So for instance, AlphaFold just predicts the st final structure, but does not predict how the structure became from the sequence. Uh, what, what will be the folding process? Another possibility, uh, the point mutations, since we are working with the multiple sequence alignment, then one mutation somewhere does not change much. So alpha fold is known well uh, not to much reproduce the, the individual mutations effects. But for instance, a uh, quarter year ago, there was another paper from DeepMind, which was called Alpha Missense where they've trained for the effect of single point mutations, SNPs, and they run whole human proteome to change every amino acid to every other amino acid by one to, one to another, and then they compared it with the known clinical variants and the pathology of these clinical variants, and alpha missions is working the best for all the predictors which we have currently for individual uh, predictors of pathogenicity of individual point mutations. 
And it's quite nice, I must say. And it's taking the, the, the structural point of view as well. As I've said, uh, it's not that useful for drug design in comparison with the experimental structure. But if you don't have experimental structure, it still can tell you something. AlphaFold make you one single structure. So if you have multiple conformators of something, and the conformational changes and dynamics are not within the, within the structure itself, uh, the, I've spoken about the multiple proteins. It does not have any post-translation modifications in it, and it does not show you ligand effects. And if you have an orphan sequence, which doesn't have any multiple sequence alignment, you basically are done for nothing, because you cannot make the, the start for alpha fold. Or is it? Well, one part is that the alpha fold actually can help with the folding process, because the, uh, it starts with the multiple sequence alignment, and the multiple sequence alignment gives us relatively close to the final structure. So it basically tells us how the structure and what the folding will be based from the sequence. And only later on it, uh, it refines that with this uh, finding, uh, fine tuning of the distances of the individual pair atoms. It still can do point mutations, and here is the, uh, here is the structure. Minimal sequence code for switching protein structure and function from Alexander in 2009. And they took two proteins, which were differing only in few amino acids, and then they tuned amino acid by amino acid to see when this alpha helices will change for the alpha plus beta sheet. And I've tried to redo this experiment by alpha fold. And AlphaFold, when you are running it, actually doesn't produce you with one model, but you can tune how many models you, you will get. So I was using the default five. And basically, I was able to see the switch. The only part was here, where this beta structure, which changed by just one amino acid in between the alpha, all alpha and the one with the beta, there were the mishap between that I got, got like three structures of one type and two structures from another. So it was possible to catch this. But uh, when this was done for a switching proteins in the larger data sets, it's not that great. There are better methods now to, to, to get, uh, generate this. And one of those methods is this mutamore. Uh, which is coming from Burghard Ross. And uh, this uh, basically is that you can generate all SNPs of proteins using ESM fold or open fold. And then it will give you the RMSD of that specific change. So basically, you can see by sequence changed whether there will be some movement and some change within the structure on that specific position. Yeah, because here you can see that, oh, especially this part, makes huge differences and larger arm is D. Uh, alpha fold predicts mainly hollow protein structures because it takes the, the data from the, uh, from the PDB where there are ligands in it. So if there is a ligand in the, in the training data, the alpha fold basically takes the structure with the ligand but deletes it because it does not have anything for the ligand itself. But it takes the around surrounding and models to the surrounding as such that it might be with the ligand inside. But as I've said, unfortunately, uh, it's not that good as the experimental results. But the experimental structures might not be the results as well. So here is the nice example from the last uh, two years ago. The, uh, they've tried to benchmark the docking uh, for the uh, alpha fold and the, uh, uh, and the experimental uh, structures. And uh, these are the receiver operating curves. 
And uh, the area under the receive of receiver operating curves give you the information whether you are selecting the true, po true positives or you are selecting the false positives. So these are true positives and here are false positives, basically sorted by the energy from the poses. And the, the ideal, ideal uh, ROC curve would be that first you would take all of the true positives and then all false positives. This does not happen often. So if you take the thing, the individual poses by random, you will receive this approximately this 50% uh, line. Because in that case, you are selecting randomly between true and false positives. And you can see <coughs> that in some cases, the blue, one, blue curves are for the experimental uh, structures and black ones are for the alpha fold. And you can see that basically it's quite comparable in those cases everywhere. And with the experimental structures quite often you are on the bad luck as well as with the alpha fold. Uh, so it's when, when this is to all taken together, just the alpha fold, uh, Vina on alpha fold two structures is basically average, this random part. But uh, the experiment is also bad. It's also 0 0.46. Not much difference, but they found out that it's possible to rescore the Vina results by additional deep learning methods like Nina and others, and they were able to reach 0 0.6. So that was an improvement over the both cases. And they, this is the study uh, which I was speaking on Monday and yesterday Pavel was speaking as well. And that's the, that's the current story that uh, they've uh, docked using dock free and they were docking to uh, two receptors, sigma 2 receptor and 5-HTH5. Uh, and they've docked either to the experimental structure or the alpha fold and then they were screening and then took, they, took the, they, they took the molecules and did the experimental screen with them to see how well it will work. And actually, it find that on alpha fold they were able to find the molecule which was the best of all for the binding for that receptor. Which was completely unknown from anything else from the previous screens. So it can give you a completely new result. Yeah? Uh, what are the details of the evaluation, like how many molecules did they synthesize and try in the end? 70 and 64. 70 and 64. Okay. And it was the best one was from the alpha fold? Yeah, the best one was coming from the alpha fold. And it was completely unrelated to anything else known from previous ways. Yeah. So that seemed... The, they they concluded that basically for a prospective study, it can actually be more useful because you are telling you are looking for something uh, different than from the previous. The rest of the molecules, uh, which were the best then it was basically quite similar. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very nice, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now it's quite. It's to some extent it's contradictory to the previous result, which was saying that the, when you are docking into the experimental structure, you are getting do dock docked poses much better than in case of alpha fold structures. But that's because you are getting different ones. But those ones might be useful as well. And unfortunately, this is the part where we experiment we need experimentalists to tell us the real truth. Yeah. <coughs> One point is that uh, the alpha fold by itself is producing usually one single conformer. But it's possible to make masking and basically to see whether there, there is some kind of uh, interactions which is basically blocking the another conformer and mask it in the multiple sequence alignment and you can reach for another structure different one in different conformation. So now there are protocols that basically allows to generate the structures and to find out whether you will get another conformer or not. Here is one example where we've tried to do this for the SLC transporters and 
there are two different ways, uh, outward facing and inward facing structures. And as you can see, the alpha fold is quite similar to the outward facing, not to the inward facing. But this is the really nice uh, database uh, of uh, all human kinases. Uh, because the human kinases, there we have something like 437 of them, the active ones. We have multiple uh, pseudokinases, but let's say. And out of that, uh, we have uh, 268 kinases in PDB, but only 155 are in active conformation. When we look into the alpha fold database, there are 209 in active form, so it's already improvement, but not, not that much. So uh, Roland Dunbreck and uh, his colleagues basically did uh, tuning of multiple sequence alignment for, this, for uh, the templates of individual kinases which were missing. And they basically tried multiple ways how to generate multiple conformations. And they've stated that while there is no one single method that would give you the conformers <coughs> that you need, uh, when they've tried to combine different approaches, like different depths of multiple sequence alignments, they came up with different models. And because they, they had the, the analyzer to find out what this, how the active uh, structure of kinase looks like, based on their long-term experience of kinases, they were able to collect all of those kinases in active manner. So, and they are now providing them on the King Core database. So it's quite nice way how you can reach the, the another conformations that are uh, uh, that are important for the act, for the understanding of the community. As I said. Uh, the uh, PLLDT is giving you the hints about the movement and dynamics of that structure. And this is the meatball with the spaghetti, as I've said. And uh, one thing which is quite nice is that <laughs> PLLDT is actually our best predictor for the disorder in the structures currently, according to this pro database analysis. So while we were looking for the structures, we now have a nice predictor for not <laughs> this disorder as well. And this is just uh, another part. Uh, I would just f slowly finishing uh, on the uh, what you can do with the ligands. And you can transplant the ligands from PDB into the alpha fold structures. And alpha, fo alpha fill database is doing exactly that. So basically, if you have a protein which is known for echo factor or where you want to have the ligands as well, it's possible to look into the alpha fill. And there are alpha fold models filled with the, uh, filled with the cofactors taken and transported from the, uh, from the uh, uh, PDB. And you get the information which structure is actually a good one. And for the orphans, it's possible to use uh, protein language models, models like ESM Fold, which is running really smoothly. Uh, this one was developed by Facebook, uh, by Meta. And uh, it gives you really quick uh, way how to generate the structures. And it's much more sensitive for the, uh, for the individual uh, uh, mutation, point mutations. And because now we have these quick methods, how to predict something, like to predict the protein from the structure, uh, uh, from the sequence to, to predict the structure, there are already methods which are doing it vice versa. So you have a structure, and you are tuning the protein sequence that will give you better, let's say, production of the protein, or better activity, better stability, or whatever. And one of those uh, features is protein MPNN, where you, are, where you are basically taking and you are returning back for and tuning the sequence for a given structure. And another, uh, another part of this is this chroma diffusion mo generative model. And uh, as I've already shown on the, uh, on the, uh, our small gift to all the lecturers, the letter D, I haven't found any 
protein in protein data bank. Therefore, I've generated it with Chroma uh, in order to make it look like uh, letter D. But that was just a protein. But since the uh, last year, there were two, uh, two new features which were generating also the ligands. And uh, Rosetta Fold All Atom is, ever, is able to basically to, that you generate the input of the ligand and then it generates you the protein structures which would bind strongly to that. And so basically this is that, that's the heme with some ligand and you basically generate the structure of the cytochrome B450 around it. It's quite cool because it was experimentally proven as well within the paper. And it's not the only one. There is a ligand MPNN which also gives you this possibility. And this one comes with the GitHub. As, as the all, usually all of those methods are available at the GitHub and you can try them on yourself to, to basically generate something for you, for your tunable appointment. So I think it's time to wrap up. <coughs> uh, since the beginning of the alpha fold, we now are able to predict the protein structure with quite similar efficiency, quite similar precision as the experimental, uh, experimental uh, methods are able. It wouldn't be possible without the protein data bank and its 50 years of data curation and openness to everyone. The CASP competition was basically a driver for this change and how this thing. It's, it's, it's publicly available and there are multiple places where you can basically run it, where you can install it and, and run it on your own software. And there is a hell of number of alpha foldology tools which are starting from this and trying to make some part of further questions further, like to put there the ligands, put there the post-translation modifications, uh, use this in order to generate the protein structures, everything like that. But, and there are of course limits, but we are pushing at these limits with development of new, uh, new methods every day. And especially in the field of this, uh, of this protein structure uh, prediction, there is paper like every week which changes something which was not true before. Okay, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please do, please do ask. <laughs> Martina? You were mentioning uh, this uh, party mirrors. Yeah. Uh, the filling uh, sequence. Uh, but I used this uh, just a common one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question goes uh, towards uh, there are options to uh, post uh, minimize with molecular mechanics which helps a lot of uh, the clashes. Mm -hmm. And all of these you are talking about, do they use this uh, post minimization or uh, to some extent some of them yes, some of them no. For instance the collab fault, uh, there is an option that you can no, switch it on or off. ESM fault doesn't use anything like that because it gives you the, the structure within a few seconds. There is no possibility that there would be any molecular dynamic simulations on that. Uh, for those other, uh, for those generative models which are making the, the protein, the, the tuning the sequence, then the protein according to the shape, those are using trajectories, but this is the diffusion trajectory. It's not molecular dynamic simulation. It's just basically, it's quite similar to how, the, how you are generating the images in Midjourney or Dali. Yeah. That you are basically coming from the noise structure and you are tuning it according to what you want. So I wouldn't say that in many cases you are actually using molecular dynamic simulations. If you want to take out the clashes, then of course, yes. And of course, there are some structures in AlphaFold database because 
as they are doing it in large scale. Uh, my colleagues from Brno who are looking for validation of everything, of, of the structures, they found quite a nice approaches that there were phenylalanines crossing to each other by a side chains and so on. So this type of er errors, but nothing that much serious, I would say. And if you would have two phenylalanines cross t crossing to each other, molecular amics will not help you. Well, well, since uh, all of those collab folds are Jupyter notebooks, it's relatively easy. The problem with the RNA yeah, the problem with RNA structures is that we don't have so many RNA structures resolved experimentally, and the ones which ha we have are either really tiny bits of something, which is usually bind to some protein, or whole ribosomes, and nothing much in between. So, according to the people in the field, they don't seem to be really expecting breakthrough similar to alpha fold in nucleic acid anytime soon. They need more data in the middle, basically. So maybe in a few years it will be possible once there will be more data on that and maybe by some kind of a transfer learning, but I don't know. Okay, if there is no question and there is no question in YouTube, Dominiku? Okay, so with that, let me thank you again, and we'll switch for Federica and her lecture on molecular design. Okay, thank you so much and good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Federica, I'm from the University of Naples and I've uh, been always involved in uh, uh, drug design process and uh, especially in the development of uh, pharmacophore models or uh, structure-based drug design and molecular dynamics and uh, uh, lead optimization processes. So uh, today with this, uh, uh, with this lecture, I would like to give you some, uh, uh, an overview about the um, molecular drug design approach that we can uh, undertake in order to have uh, ident identification and lead opt optimization of, uh, of the drugs, and especially those based on the structure-based drug design. So. First of all, I would like to give you an overview about the drug discovery process. If we can look at the drug discovery process, we can imagine this process as in this way, as an arrow, which is divided by several steps. And basically, when we arrived at the final step of a drug discovery, a drug discovery process, then uh, we will have a high risk that our designed molecule will fail. And uh, this is uh, quite a pity because 
as you can see, a drug discovery process took about uh, uh, 12 or 15 years to be overcome. So uh, we have this last phase, the clinical trials that uh, are the most uh, um, difficult step because sometimes here all the drugs that we have designed um, fails from the collateral effect and the toxicity. So we have to be very uh, careful in order to avoid this kind of uh, uh, failures. So if we look instead at the beginning on the step, we can uh, see that uh, the first step of the drug discovery process is the disease, the identification of the disease. So we have to look at which disease we want to cure and for which drug we are looking for. We are looking for, are we looking for, for uh, anti-cancer drugs, antiviral drugs, anti-Parkinson or anti-Alzheimer drugs? This is quite important because from the disease we can choose the biological target of interest and we can use them um, for the therapeutic design of our drug. And so the biological target, the choice of the biological target is maybe the crucial step of the, all the entire drug discovery process. And why? This is basically because uh, given a biological target, once we have a biological target, then we can uh, screen a lot of molecules or we design, can we design a lot of molecules that have strong interaction with the, with the target. And then we can define the binding strength of the ligand because is the binding strength of the ligand is which determines the effectiveness of the drug. And we, if we can imagine the binding strength, we can see that it is like this kind of curve, this, this kind of binding curve, in which we have the ligand concentration against the uh, rate of the receptor binding site occupied by the drug. So we can look that uh, with this binding curve, we can derive a sort of KD, disassociation this constant, from of the ligand, which is strictly depends on the ligand concentration. So we can have this kind of behavior and we can define the KD when the concentration of the ligands is enough to occupy half of the binding sites of the receptor. So once we have defined the KD, we can see that we can uh, uh, predict the binding strength of the ligand because lower is KD and higher is the binding strength of the, of the ligand. So then once we can, uh, um, uh, once we have decided the biological target, we can uh, start with the heat identification step. This step is like, uh, uh, you know, uh, when uh, we screen a lot of molecules, with a virtual screening process, um, the heat identification um, could be uh, a molecule that is not has not so strength in the binding, uh, because uh, sometimes we during a virtual screening process, when we have to uh, screen a lot of molecules, we can uh, have a sort of inaccuracy in the calculation of the binding affinity. So when we look at the heat identification process, we can have a molecules that uh, has a lower binding affinity. But it does not care because after the heat identification, the next step is the optimization of the molecule. So once we have identified that the the basic, the basic scaffold of the molecules we can imagine to uh, look at the interaction between the molecules and its target. So we can uh, 
uh, add some kind of substitution in the molecule in order to make, uh, to increase the interaction with the target uh, and also to increase the binding affinity of the molecule. So in these kinds of steps, uh, we can have a um, lead molecule that uh, has um, a quite good affinity with the target and also when we send the lead optimized molecules to preclinical cells, let's say in vitro or uh, in vivo in animals assays, we can have uh, a molecule with uh, a good uh, uh, a good activity with uh, in the range of micromolar or also nanomolar. So when we have successful preclinical assays, the last step is to uh, send them to the clinical st studies and uh, specifically in the phase one, phase two, phase three. So this, this is the uh, most difficult, as I said before, the most difficult phase because we, uh, it, it is possible that our molecule, yes, is a good, has a good activity, but it has also a um, strong collateral effect or high toxicity, so it fails. For this reason, uh, we can uh, uh, use a drug design approach and computational alternatives in order to um, overcome the uh, limitation of the drug discovery process. And specifically, if we look at this, uh, at this study, we have seen that um, recently there was a very high number of drugs that failed in different phases of clinical trials. And if we look at this study uh, published in 2018, we, uh, we can imagine that so uh, only for only 59 new drugs that were uh, uh, approved by the FDA between 2015 and 2016, the cost of the dr entire drug discovery process was very, very high. So, um, from this uh, evidence, we can see how adopting the um, computational alternatives in the drug discovery process is really important because they are low cost, efficient, and broad spectrum, so which means that uh, with the uh, uh, computational alternatives, we can uh, identify a lot of molecules, even with uh, different scaffold between them. So why are uh, the computational methods so important? Because nowadays we have a huge available amount of uh, uh, crystal X-ray, crystallography structures, or NMR, uh, structures that can help us to uh, design new molecules. So given this, uh, this huge amount of structures, we can skip from traditional drug discovery to rational drug design. And this is quite important if you, we look at this, skip, uh, this step, because now, nowadays, the design of drugs are rational, are based on the information of the uh, target binding sites. So let's see here um, a sort of uh, um, a summary uh, that um, gives uh, you an overview of the entire pipeline of a drug discovery process during, for instance, a virtual screening. Uh, so, it, in the, uh, at the beginning of the study, we can start with uh, a very huge number of compounds, uh, thousands, but also millions of compounds, so we can start a basic research. Then we can filter our molecules um, in, based on their affinity with our, our target or their physical chemistry properties, and then we can send thousands and hundreds of them into preclinical research, so uh, in vitro assay, uh, and finally we can uh, reach uh, 
an amount of five or uh, molecules to be sent to clinical trials and then only one will be approved. So if we look at this kind of funnel, uh, we can see how important are the in silico drug design techniques because we can start with a very huge amount of molecules and we can, it can lead to just one molecule to be, to be approved. So um, let's give you a sort of uh, history, some history about the discovery, drug discovery, uh, because a uh, long time ago, the, uh, the drug design was made for serendipity, a process, which is random, which means random. So if, if we, I have uh, put just two examples of uh, drugs that were discovered by serendipity, uh, like uh, in this case the penicillium and also the chlorpromazine were discovered by serendipity. But today the story is quite different because, as I said before, we have um, skipped to rational drug design. So we can use today computer aided computer simulations design, drug design, to uh, gain much information of the target. And if we, you remember, I said that the, having the information of the target is the crucial step in the drug discovery process. So all these kind of technique, all this kind of approach are important because they can gain, they can give us the molecular determinants of the drug, drug target interaction. And we can basically divide the in silico technique in ligand based drug design, structure based talking that we will see later, or also molecular dynamics. And uh, so, with the exception of the ligand based uh, drug design, which uh, you will um, will, you will look tomorrow, um, in which the discovery is, the drug discovery is uh, um, undertaken by looking at the similarity between uh, each kind of molecule. Uh, the other step of the other in silico techniques are mainly based using target information. So let's uh, give you um, an overview also with the, of the virtual screening process. The virtual screening process is another in silico approach that allowed us to obtain drug, mole drug molecules. And uh, so as, as you've seen also before, in virtual screening process we can uh, use a database of hundreds or thousands of compounds to be screened, like in this uh, funnel, and uh, by ap applying a sort of a several filters in the molecules, we can have uh, uh, one putative molecule to be sent to um, to clinical studies. So. Which are the main steps of the virtual screening? So, as let's say we have started with a lot, uh, a huge amount of molecules. Then we can filter them for, for instance, for the uh, chemical physical properties, like, uh, for instance, the Lipinski's rule of five, or maybe the by considering the pharmacokinetics of the drug, so we can predict the absorption, the distribution, metabolism, so the entire admit profile of the molecules. Or we can filter them at this step, we can filter them using other, um, other filter, uh, for instance, let's say the paints, for which we have um, Seen, we have seen more so uh, yesterday about the uh, the importance of uh, avoid paints molecules, uh, the duplication because sometimes uh, we um, we have to be careful when we choose our database because sometimes in the, the our original database molecules are in duplication. So once the first step is to avoid duplicate molecules in order to uh, save time in the calculation. 
heterogeneity, which means scaffold diversity. This is an import another important filter because um, if we look at the similarity process, we can see that when molecules are highly similar between them, it could be they will have also the same, the similar activity. So, or also inactivity. So, if we have uh, a database with a lot of molecules very similar between them, if one fails, the other probably will fail. So, it is important to have an heterogeneity in the, scaff in the chemical scaffold of the molecules. Then, another important filter is to avoid molecules with reactive functional groups. And uh, then another kind of filter is to evaluate the target affinity, so the scoring function of the filtered molecules so against the target. So this is the lead optimization stage. And then, as I said, the in vitro assays are uh, pharmacokinetic studies to evaluate also the uh, biodistribution of the molecules. And uh, to do this, inside this kind of funnel, as I said before, basically we can divide it the in silico approach in structure-based and ligand-based. So we will focus in the structure-based drug design and uh, um, one approach in the structure-based drug design is to uh, to have to create a pharmacophore model uh, of our ligand against its its target. So basically, I I, I will not give you uh, so much details about pharmacophores because tomorrow you will have the lesson about pharmacophore. But the basic uh, definition is that with a pharmacophore model we can collect a series. Uh, of uh, ligand features that ensure the optimal interaction with the target and uh, some, this kind of feature can uh, activate the biological response of the target. So we, using the pharmacophore models we can uh, have the ligand features needed for the interaction with the target and needed for, to ensure the biological activity of the target. So, for instance, hydrogen bond acceptor, hydrogen bond donor, uh, hydrophobic group, and so on. So, a uh, pharmacophore model is um, a one in silico technique that can, uh, we can use in the structure-based drug design. Another important uh, um, approach that I didn't mention is the fragment-based drug design. If we look at the fragment-based drug design, it, we can see that in the last 20 years, uh, it became very popular because uh, the fragment-based drug design can give uh, high-quality results and high-quality uh, probability to find lead candidates. It is quite different with respect uh, uh, a drug design process because with a fragment drug design we can we will have not a drug like molecule but a lead like molecules which are uh, the fragments of molecules with a molecular weight between 115 and 250 dalton and uh, the importance of this kind of uh, uh, in silico approach is summarized in these five points why so fragment base is so important because with fragment base we can have uh, uh, fragments that are able to bind protein hotspots and then we will see what it means protein hotspots and fragment binding is enthalpy driven okay high quality hydrogen bond it means that uh, they are a hydrogen bond that will stay into the hot spot of the protein. I will see you later, but um, uh, that stay within the hot spot of the protein 
and they are maintained even when, even when we are optimizing the fragments. So they are crucial for the interaction with the hotspot. They are not missed. For instance, in molecular dynamics, when you send uh, the fragments or the optimized fragments in molecular dynamics, we will see that the those hydrogen bonding will be maintained. Okay? And um, then we um, will have that interaction patterns defined by fragments are similar to those defined by the drug. Okay? Because the next step in the fragment based is to optimize the, the fragment. So here I have uh, just uh, summarized the, the main step of a fragment base. So we will start a fragment based approach with the hotspot identification within the target and uh, the uh, heat identification of the fragment. So uh, within uh, one of the hotspots of the, of the protein and then the lead optimization with uh, can be uh, uh, undertaken uh, using uh, more advanced molecular techniques, drug design techniques like uh, molecular dynamics or steroid molecular dynamics and so on. So here I will uh, uh, um, let you know about the first uh, example of uh, a drug discovery success, um, fragment discovery success that uh, uh, led to the discovery of uh, uh, a drug that uh, is the ver ver verumafenib, which is a BRAF uh, very potent inhibitor, selective inhibitor. And uh, let's see that this uh, drug was discovered by um, fragment base starting from a huge amount of fragments uh, library, then uh, uh, which was filtered uh, and then uh, which was selected some fragment hits. Fragment hits were then uh, um, uh, evaluated for their interaction with the hotspots of the protein. And let's see in this case that the seven indole moiety of the molecules uh, is uh, interacts with uh, two hydrogen bonds with the hotspot of the protein, and then it led the um, optimization of the mo of the molecules of the fragments. And as we can see, the quality of the hydrogen bonds means like this one. So we can uh, optimize the fragments, so we can have a, a more uh, a large a larger molecule, but Although this, the um, two basic hydrogen bonds with the hotspot are maintained. So um, this is very important to maintain the interaction with the fragment and the hotspot in the protein. Uh, basically, what are hotspots? Hotspots in the protein are protein sites that are able to bind with the fragment sites. Uh, so they are not really binding sites, but they are able to bind the fragments. So they are s like small binding sites, okay, that cannot be binded by drug, but by fragment. And uh, the, there is a cross relationship between, between uh, the hotspot and the fragments. And because if a protein does not have strong hotspots, so we will have uh, uh, a high risk that our fragment screen will fail because we, we won't find uh, a fragment uh, binding to the hotspots. And also quite important are the primary hotspots. The primary hotspots are, the, um, def are defined as the highest binding uh, uh, potency hotspots. So, uh, this is very important because fragment basically binds the primary hotspots. And we can see here that once again, when we uh, optimize the fragments, the basic scaffold, the basic 
fragments stays in the hotspot, um, keep interacting, interacting with the hotspot. Okay, so the binding conservation, the binding mode conservation of the fragment within the hotspot is another assumption of the fragment-based drug design because there is the uh, assumption that the binding mode of the fragment does not vary during the fragment to lead op optimization. Are there exceptions? Yes, because we are the so-called flipping fragments. As we can see here, this is uh, a plot uh, that I think quite summarized uh, the, um, the concept of uh, flipping fragments. And we can see here that when we will uh, increase uh, the molecular weight of the fragment, uh, we can see that uh, very flexible or very uh, small fragments are um, does not maintain their binding mode conformation with respect to uh, mole to fragments with the higher molecular weight, in which instead they keep their binding mode conservation within the hotspot of the protein. So this is um, quite a, a very um, nice overview about also the binding mode conservation and. Uh, which depends on the size of the fragments. As I said before, we can uh, uh, gain, uh, uh, we can improve the fragment-based drug design by combining the drug, the mm, fragment-based uh, with the more advanced uh, techniques like uh, molecular dynamics but also steroid molecular dynamics and uh, to, to see better if the binding mode or the interaction with the target is kept run during, the, um, during the molecular dynamics. Here I would like to give you just uh, um, an example for which uh, the application of the steroid molecular dynamics on a fragment molecule will lead to this kind of curve that uh, it, it uh, describes the work necessary to uh, throw out the, uh, the fragment from the, the molecule. So higher is the work, better is the affinity with the, uh, of the fragment with the, within the hotspot. So this is uh, uh, also an, uh, a clear example of uh, that we can combine uh, molecular dynamics or steroid, in this case, molecular dynamics with this methodology. And this is quite important because when we talk about fragment-based but structure-based or even docking approach, we will not, um, during this kind of screening, we will not consider the receptor flex flexibility. And uh, the, uh, so this, is, this could be quite a, a problem because, uh, you know, the uh, receptors, even the receptors are going to adapt to make uh, some conformational change when they uh, accommodate one ligand. So uh, taking into account the receptor flexibility is quite important. Uh, the, last, uh, um, the last approach that I would like to, um, to describe you is uh, a very recent uh, approach, uh, um, which is uh, nowadays we can consider it to, um, to be a part of uh, computer either drug design methods and uh, is the uh, retro drug design process. What does the, the, the means retro drug design? Retro drug design is, you know, we can define it as the opposite of a drug design because we, in this kind of approach, we will not start from the molecule, but we will start from the target, from the target identification. So in this kind of process, we can start by selecting multiple uh, targets and multi the, the multiple properties 
physical properties of the target, and then we can use the molecule, the target properties to generate uh, qualified compound structures by uh, using uh, machine learning or deep learning models, also PCA, and then to uh, have uh, some uh, molecules which uh, are in which the predicted properties are quite close to those measured. As we can see here, these are 20 molecules uh, that uh, will be discovered by uh, retro drug design. And as we can see here, we can see some molecular properties of such, um, uh, of such molecules. And we can see that uh, all the predicted um, uh, properties of such molecules, uh, like log P, for instance, the solubil solubility, the cytotoxicity, are quite close to some, most of the measured one um, properties. Then, what we can say once we have, uh, at the end of the story, what we can say about drug design process. We can say that uh, we have uh, still a lot to learn because although these, the computational techniques are useful to uh, improve the drug design process, we are still far because we have uh, still a lot of challenges and problems to overcome. And uh, so uh, the, first, uh, mm, the first step is to for instance, improve the efficacy of virtual screening methods. Because as I said before, in a virtual screening, uh, for instance, we do not take into account the receptor flex flexibility or the calculation, the prediction of the binding affinity is quite inaccurate because we have a lot of molecules to, evalu to evaluate. So the first step is to, to uh, improve the efficacy of the virtual scanning process, improving also the computational chemogenomic studies, and also to enhancing the algorithm for toxicity, toxicity prediction. As I said before, the most of molecules, most of drug will fail for their effect, collateral effect or for their to toxicity. So we need uh, uh, several tools able to uh, predict uh, with uh, uh, high accuracy the toxicity of some molecules, and it is important to consider them when we have to filter molecules during a virtual screening process. Uh, then we can use uh, an, another way to improve the drug design process is to combine them with uh, uh, combinatorial chemistry or high throughput screening. So it is a good method to, uh, method to improve uh, the design of the molecules because uh, um, another um, um, problem of the virtual screening and is that in most cases, we, we ignore uh, the protonation and the tautomerism effect uh, uh, and as well as the ionization effect of the molecules. So uh, we can uh, um, further uh, test our molecules by high throughput screening or combinatorial chemistry. Then, uh, and it is, uh, uh, we are uh, undertaking uh, this process by combining molecular modeling, integrating molecular modeling with machine learning or deep learning technique, also to avoid high false positive rates in our drug design process. Um, so, for instance, uh, the retro drug design today is, um, uh, it was uh, recently introduced, but uh, I think we can also use even this kind of approach with deep learning or machine learning uh, approach to improve the drug discovery process. So I have finished it. If you have questions, please feel free. Thank you. Our questions? If not, 
okay so we can uh, I think we have that in coffee break I think okay we so we can uh, uh, see in few minutes for the molecular docking uh, lectures
quella che, ancora, che mi hai mandato con Corona e scaricate perché non mi è arrivata la mail. Ho detto, ma mi è arrivata la mail e scarico tutto che seguo con Corona. Ma cosa fa? Eh, no, a me ancora non è arrivato lo stipendio, mi ha detto che ci sono un errore nella data. Te lo giuro, perché tu come è possibile che mi hai arrivato? E se non potete scrivere, non so se non avete scritto la vostra. Non so se non potete fare qualcosa perché non mi sento che non potete insegnare su un'altra cosa. Non so se non potete fare qualcosa perché non mi sento che non potete fare qualcosa. Non so se non potete fare qualcosa perché non mi sento che non potete fare qualcosa. Non so se non potete fare qualcosa perché non mi sento che non potete fare qualcosa. Non so se non potete fare qualcosa a já jsem to zase měl větší, to je zase dvaměr. Já jsem na tom žil tak na vodu, co jsem si vydal z nějakého designu, tak ten by moc nepomohl, tak jsem si našel nějaký jiný, a to mi taky nepomohl. Ale si mě jsem tě jako na vodu, když jsem byl nějaký vlastní patán, když jsem byl na paráci dostal. Jo. 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 Jo.
mails and go. And I at least send it by mail so that you could send when you open the email. That is an important point. And I don't know if you can get it stuck in the email. And I was able to figure out my email and go. Why I would like to do that because not being able to get it to the email.
Thank you. So let's start again. This, this time with molecular docking. Then let's see how, which are the main uh, trick of this kind of procedure. And so let's start. Okay. I don't know if you are familiar with docking, but I uh, would like just to at the beginning to give you some basic principles about this uh, uh, this uh, methodology and uh, just we can give uh, a definition of a molecular doc docking which is uh, an important step in the drug discovery uh, which calculates the favorite position the favorite geometry of the ligand uh, uh, to its target, okay? Not only. With molecular docking, we can also predict the binding affinity of the ligand uh, against its, its target. So let's uh, uh, have uh, a receptor with uh, a ligand with a, a certain sh molecular shape. We can, with the molecular docking, we can give the complex, the final complex, so the ligand, how it interacts within the receptor. And this kind of process is very important for the research researchers because uh, with, uh, uh, when we look at the uh, molecular interaction between the ligand and its target, we can also understand what are the fundamental biochemical processes that underline the ligand target interaction and that are needed for the biological activity of the target. Uh, which are the potential use of the molecular docking. We can use molecular docking in a drug discovery, for instance, during the virtual screening process, as we have seen before. Uh, during the uh, drug design, because in the drug discovery, we usually uh, use a huge database of molecules, but when we undertake an optimization of the molecule, we can use few molecules, maybe one ligand, to optimize it. And then the same approach can be used also for peptides, optimization. Peptides are only in the therapeutic, are even in the therapeutic use. And so we can perform in this kind 
in this topology, uh, we can uh, uh, undertake protein-protein interaction. And also, it is quite used also in the nutraceutical field because uh, we can uh, uh, screen not only drugs, not only molecular organic molecules, but we can use also natural compounds or food-derived compounds to be screened against a specific target. Okay, so it is widely used also in the nutraceutical fields. Okay, let's see uh, how many types of docking do we have. Um, basically, one uh, type of docking is defined as global docking or blind docking. What does it mean? It means that in blind docking, we do not have any prior knowledge of the binding site of the receptor. Uh, in this case, we can't we do not have a specific, a specific binding pocket, a, spe a specific binding cavity, but we have to consider the entire protein, the whole target, as uh, to, be, uh, to be docked. Okay? And uh, this means that uh, in this case, we have to uh, run several trials, several docking runs for each putative binding sites. In this case, uh, when we have to undertake a blind docking, it is useful to um, make some uh, binding site prediction with uh, computational tools. Then we have uh, uh, local docking. Local docking is, uh, you know, the most uh, uh, most uh, docking approach are local because we know exactly the shape of the binding sites, we know exactly the, the cavity, so we can just uh, consider it the cavity to be target from the dock, from the ligand. Okay, so in this case, the aim of local docking is to predict, uh, to find the, uh, the, the, the geometry and also the position of the ligand in the, that binding site. Other types of docking, uh, we have, we can divide the docking in basically into two, uh, two approach. We have the right rigid docking and the flexible docking. I will also add the semi-flexible docking. Um, in the rigid docking, we can uh, uh, look at the theory introduced by Emil Fischer in, 1880, in 1894, um, and it, it can, we can compare the uh, ligand and target interaction as in the same way as the key with the lock. And uh, why this, this comparison? Because in this uh, uh, approach, we will have uh, um, the, the importance of this kind of approach is the complementary geometry shape of the ligand that has to be uh, fitted into the lock, so into the target. In this way, so we can compare the ligand is the key while the target is the lock. In this case, we cannot uh, use flexible ligands, but uh, the fitness is only uh, characterized by the shape of the ligand and the geometrical complementary of the ligand shape. So ligand that has not the same shape as the binding cavity will not be docked or will be ranked with a very bad affinity. Uh, we have also the flexible docking. Uh, this kind of theory was instead introduced by Daniel Koshlang in 1858. And in this kind of uh, methodology, we will treat both the ligand and the target as flexible. So uh, both of them will undergo to conformational changes in order to adapt themselves and to reach a final complex between the substrate and the enzyme cavity, okay, or the ligand and the enzyme cavity. I will add, as I said before, also the semi-flexible docking. 
in which we can treat uh, only the ligand as flexible and uh, the target re as rigid. Okay? But uh, they uh, are very useful, Bo both uh, flexible, semi-flexible and rigid docking are quite uh, uh, used at uh, docking uh, methodologies. So, let's start, if we want to start uh, a docking calculation, first of all, we have to look at the target, okay? And specifically, we have uh, to understand, uh, to analyze, which kind of target do we have. Specifically, it is very good, uh, if possible, to, to treat docking by having a, a crystal structure. Um, because in this way we can use experimental PDB model and so we can have a, um, an exact definition of the atomic coordinates. When it is not possible, we can use also homology model. But in this case, we have to be very careful because previous to the docking calculation, we have to see the quality of our mod homology modeling. So um, if we have a bad homology model, we will have bad docking results, okay? So inaccuracy in the binding affinity or artifacts in the docking calculations. When possible, we have to check in the protein data bank, if we look, and if we have a crystal structure, we have to check if uh, a co-crystallized molecule exists in the, pro in the protein data bank. So if we can, to take into account receptors with an experimental uh, co-crystallized molecule bound inside. Why? Because in this way, we can compare the, uh, as we will see later, we can uh, easily predict uh, the performance of our docking program. Okay? Because our docking software, as we, see, we will see later, works in a very different way because they have um, different algorithms, algorithms and different scoring functions. So one way to look at which docking software we have to use is to compare is the, the, the performance to see which docking software is able to discriminate the experimental binding mode of the ligand with the docked one. Okay? So, but even when we have available crystal structures, uh, we will have a problem. I mean, it's not clear now, but uh, I will explain to you that um, we have to check. When we, we will use a crystal structures, we have to check the electron density map of the target. Uh, by looking at the X-ray electron density map, we can see uh, the quality of our model. And we can see uh, the resolution of our X-ray structures. For instance, if we look at uh, this panel, we can see here that at one angstrom of resolution, we will have the electron density map that is quite uh, uh, overlapped with each atom of this amino acid. So in uh, this kind of uh, resolution, we will have uh, a very well-defined coordinates of each atoms of the, of the target, okay? When we skip to uh, two angstrom of resolution, here we will uh, uh, have have a certain degree of uncertainty because uh, we, as we can see, there is some part of the uh, amino SM atoms that are not well defined. So as the similar as 2.7 angstrom, uh, we can see the orientation, basically the orientation of the amino acids, but we do not have uh, so much information about the position, the exact position of each atom. And so we can see here instead that three angstrom that the quality 
is uh, very, very low. So when we look at the uh, PDB structure, so uh, we have to check, uh, first of all, the resolution of our target and then the electron density map. Uh, one uh, thing that we can uh, do is also to um, uh, look at the PDP educational portal, which is uh, um, a tool of the Protein Data Bank in which we can uh, uh, gain much information about, uh, you know, the electron density map or the uh, structural biomolecules uh, and so on. So it is uh, quite useful to, to look at these kinds of uh, information uh, when we look for uh, the um, <coughs> PDB structure. So another thing that we have to do is how to treat protons, because um, in a PDB, in the X-ray structures, uh, protons are uh, very often omitted, and uh, they are not present because uh, they are crystallographer are not able to well define the position of um, protons in the with the crystallography. So uh, the first thing is to let our PDB model to have information about the, protein, the protons assignment. So we have uh, to predict them as good as possible and add them to the uh, PDB model. And then uh, we can uh, use, uh, we can add the protons uh, not only in, the un in their ionization state, but also considering the uh, possible tautomers. Okay, so we have also to uh, um, verify if tau uh, tautomers does exist. So uh, once we have a look at the structure, then we are ready, quite ready to uh, to put the ligand inside the binding pocket. Um, so, what are the problems when we have to look at the ligand instead of the target? What are the main problems that do we consider it? Um, we have to consider that when we want to put the ligand into the cavity of the receptor, we have to consider that the ligand undergoes to movements. Let's say that we want to perform a semi-flexible docking, so we have to consider the uh, rigid receptor and the ligand as flexible. So we have to see, we have to understand that the ligand will be, will undergo to several translational and rotational movements. Okay, so we have to uh, <coughs> consider all the possible um, configuration of the ligand. So we have to treat the problem about the translational movement and the rotational movement. Obviously, this is much uh, more important as the ligand will have m many rotatable bonds. And then we have to consider also the torsion of the ligand. So we have uh, uh, also a problem in the torsional space. Okay? So we have to consider how we can perform the ligand conformational uh, search. So once we have these kind of ingredients, receptor and the ligand, now we have to look how can we treat the complex um, and how, uh, which kind of program do we use to treat this problem and to have a complex. So uh, docking needs basically of two kinds of algorithms that are search algorithms and the scoring functions. The search algorithms uh, are uh, the uh, search algorithms, algorithms that uh, treat the ligand configurational space. Okay, that I said before, they will treat energetically the conformation of the ligand uh, and take the, into account 
the putative binding mode of the ligand. So in, we have a lot of search algorithms that will generate a lot of confirmation and then we will evaluate each configuration energetically by the scoring function, with the scoring function. Okay, the scoring function uh, are the algorithms that predict the binding affinity. For each conformation we have generated, we will have a scoring function we, that predict uh, its binding affinity. And a good scoring function may discriminate the experimentally observed mode from the others and, and uh, estimate the binding affinity possibly as the, the best. Okay, so once we have, for this reason, it's, it's better to have a co-crystallized ligand with, uh, with the, the in, inside the target. Because then we have, if we have this kind of situation, we can compare, we can evaluate the performance of the scoring function to uh, overlap the docket conformation with the experimental one. Okay? So this, this is a procedure known as re-docking and uh, uh, it is, uh, I think, the first step uh, that uh, we have to do when we start uh, docking, uh, docking calculations. Now let's see better both search algorithms and uh, scoring functions. Search algorithms we can be can be divided basically into two um, two kind of algorithm, algorithms: uh, systematic search and stochastic or random search. The first one. Uh, we will have uh, the conformational search, database search, and fragmentation. Fragmentation systematic search is um, a procedure in which we will uh, treat uh, each fragment of uh, the ligand, uh, and we will uh, is kind uh, is is kind of we we divide the ligand into small fragments, and for each fragments we will generate configurational. And this is mainly used when we will uh, um, undertake uh, a fragment docking. So in the fragment docking, uh, not the entire ligand is put into the uh, binding site, but the ligand is fragment. So each fragment of the ligand is uh, put uh, separately within the cavity. And then uh, for each fragment, uh, with this kind of generation of conformational search generation, we will generate separately the conformation of each fragment. Then in the database search, uh, basically, um, it's like we have uh, generated a lot of, maybe this is useful when we uh, will treat with rigid docking, because uh, in the database search, we will collect uh, the ligand conformation separately and with, without uh, in the mount state and then uh, we will collect all this kind of conformation uh, in the database it is a sort of database and then we will dock dock them as a rigid docking so we will reach we will dock each conformation in the database and then we have a classic conformational search in which uh, torsional rotational and angles uh, <coughs> uh, are treated uh, with uh, in a systematic way. So uh, we will uh, um, put uh, some conformational change by varying some degrees of freedom or um, torsional uh, uh, degrees of freedom. In the stochastic search, we instead we will have we will generate uh, basically conformation randomly. Um, we will. Uh, so we will we can define them as Monte Carlo basic genetic algorithm, which are the two most uh, uh, used uh, system uh, stochastic uh, uh, conformational search. In the Monte Carlo, we will have, uh, uh, which is used by Vina, Autodoc Vina. Uh, we will uh, use uh, uh, we will generate uh, random conformation of the ligand, and then uh, for the best ranked, uh, energetic best ranked conformation, then will be generated another conformation, and so on, okay? Um, but randomly. In the genetic algorithm, I will uh, not 
uh, give you now the details about the, the genetic algorithm because we will see better it uh, uh, then we will we'll talk about Autodoc, but uh, you can uh, uh, see that uh, the genetic algorithm uh, works uh, by, by generating a parent's conformation, and then for each parent conformation, it's gener it generates a children conformation with the best ranked one, and then uh, we will see later for each children um, conformation, we will do a local search, uh, local optimization, but we can see it uh, better later. Now let's treat the scoring functions. Uh, the scoring functions are uh, <coughs> um, algorithms that basically uh, calculate or predict the binding, uh, the quality of the uh, configuration of the ligand configuration by ranking them uh, for their binding affinity. Uh, so in the search algorithm, we do not evaluate the, the, the energy, but we only generate the confirmation, just generate confirmations. Scoring function then evaluate the each uh, confirmation found by the, the search algorithm. And basically, we have uh, four kinds of uh, scoring function. Uh, even if uh, in the last few years uh, there were uh, uh, in, there were introduced uh, um, even more scoring functions, even even uh, with uh, machine learning or deep learning uh, algorithms. Uh, so we have basically the force field based, the knowledge based scoring function. Uh, empirical function and consensus one which um, which uh, uh, it focuses uh, by uh, we considered all the um, all the previous uh, scoring functions in the first one we will treat the uh, energetic uh, of the conformational uh, ligand conformation uh, by considering the van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, or, or electrostatic interaction, and it is uh, the force field uh, based are the scoring is the scoring function adopted by Autodoc. Uh, then we have the empirical scoring function, which are quite similar to the force field based, but uh, in uh, these kinds of empirical function, we uh, will. Uh, add uh, some uh, other terms to consider the binding affinity, but we will see later. And then uh, we have the knowledge based, uh, also call it that statistical based, because uh, this is in Vina, this is, is, is based on the knowledge based scoring function, and in which we will, uh, uh, it will explore, it's the structure information of uh, a collection of known protein link and interaction, and then we will compare the mm, experimental collected data with uh, the uh, predicted one. So we uh, we can rank the energy of the conformation uh, considering the experimental uh, um, statistic of molecules within the binding sites. So uh, here we can have uh, uh, a further look, a further overview of the scoring functions. Uh, so we can see the physics based, which are the force, force field based. And so we can see here, we can have the van der Waals parameter or the electrostatic contribution, the empirical, in which the binding energy is uh, uh, due to the implementation of uh, other terms, such as the lipophilic or the hydrogen bond terms, uh, knowledge-based, in which we will calculate the potential mean force, and uh, uh, the uh, more recent machine learning based, based methods in which we will introduce also a machine in, in the binding energy, also machine learning algorithm. And, and then uh, <coughs> once we have defined all these kinds of scoring functions, we have to see which one is, um, is able to uh, to experimentally predict the conformation and discriminate it from the others. Okay, so um, the the best way is to evaluate, uh, you know, um, 
a couple of uh, docking algorithm of docking softwares in order to see which uh, scoring function or which uh, search algorithm is better than another. So let's see better the force field based uh, scoring function, which uh, is in which autodoc is based. Uh, as uh, you can see here, this, this, has the, this is the, um, the equation of the force field based. In particular, autodoc is based on the amber force field. And uh, um, in this kind of uh, um, force field based, in this kind of scoring function, we have. Uh, um, we can estimate the strength of the intermolecular interaction by considering, uh, as I said before, the van der Waals and the electrostatic uh, interaction. In addition, also the dissolvation energy is uh, taken into account in these kinds of uh, methods. And this is very important because uh, the dissolvation term uh, strictly influences also the binding, uh, the ligand binding. Mainly advantages is that um, basically this kind of the force field are the most common in the use in the docking algorithms. Uh, but uh, and this advantage is that maybe electrostatic terms or fair can be overestimated. So if we if we have uh, uh, highly charged molecules, then we can reach uh, um, problems in the ranking in the ranking of the molecules because we will overestimate the electrostatic effects. Uh, then we have the empirical scoring function in which then <coughs> the uh, the binding energy is um, uh, considered. Is very similar to the force field one, but uh, in, in this kind of uh, scoring function, we will add uh, other terms like, uh, for instance, uh, the internal energy of the ligand and the effect uh, in the rotation, so in the rotatable bonds of the ligand, in the effect in the, of the aromatic uh, moieties, uh, and also the solvation effect, and as I said before, the, internal, the global internal energy of the ligand, which is seen as a sort of penalty. So we can evaluate if the internal energy of the ligand is good enough to stay into the in this kind of in that kind of conformation within the binding site so it is a kind of penalty um, this is fast so the, the main advantage is that empirical scoring function are quite fast uh, but can it can be some discrepancy in the binding affinity calculations and uh, uh, there is obviously a uh, strict dependence in the place of hydrogen atoms. At the introduction of this lecture, I said that it is very important to add uh, protons at the target, but the same thing has to be done for the ligand. Okay, so um, if hydrogen atoms are mm, uh, bad, um, bad calculated, bad placed, uh, then we can have problems in the um, in the ranking in the of the energy with the empirical scoring function. Yes. Uh, you said that there, is, there are some discrepancies. For instance, if I have scanned uh, or give, scanned some molecules with ligand and uh, assign them some empirical scoring function, and the difference is very low, should it be trusted, or is it like? Roughly the same. Yeah, it's it's it. The discrepancy is, uh, is exactly this one. So we can have uh, a lot of conformation with, uh, you know, mm, a similar uh, binding affinity, but with uh, mm, very different conformation with each other. So it is not so good because uh, if uh, the ligand has a quite different conformation with uh, another, it should be also a different, very different binding uh, affinity. So the discrepancy is exactly this one. Then we have the knowledge-based scoring function, uh, which is the scoring function uh, that uh, Autodoc Vina use. Um, this uh, uh, scoring function is uh, as I said before, it's also uh, called the statistically scoring function because, uh, as I said before, in which, in this kind of um, 
algorithm we will uh, uh, somehow collect uh, um, several um, protein ligand complexes in the protein data bank and this kind <coughs> this kind of scoring function evaluate the distance between the pair waste atom of each of each uh, complex for instance um, look at this kind of grid and let's see that we have collected or the scoring function has collected a lot of uh, ligand protein complexes. So it creates a sort of grid around the binding site and it defines a grid point for each atom of the ligand. So we can collect exactly the distance of the green spaced between, uh, let's see, for uh, carbon atoms from another carbon atoms, we have a certain grid distance then uh, we can collect uh, information about the distance uh, between uh, carbon to, from oxygen atom, the carbon from nitrogen atoms. So we will have, we will collect uh, the statist statistically collect uh, the distance between this kind of atoms and uh, build like a grid. So in this kind of uh, scoring function, we will uh, uh, use. Uh, we will, uh, it, it, it will be based on the calculating, statistical calculating, the distance between the atom from the target, and then we can, and then it uh, uh, convert the probability to find an atom in that grid position, in that grid point, to, it, it convert to a Boltzmann probability distribution, and uh, so uh, it calculate than the potential mean force. So it converts the Boltzmann probability into the potential mean force with this kind of uh, uh, function. Okay? It is um, uh, similar to the empirical, uh, but more general because we, uh, it is focused not on the mm, prediction of the binding affinity uh, with the experimental one, but in the distance between the atoms. So it cares about the distance between uh, each atoms, okay? And then the disadvantage is that uh, when we calculate the potential mean force, is it is typically based on the pairwise of the atom, okay? On the main distance of the atom, but uh, pairwise sometimes when we calculated the distance from uh, two atoms, the distance is, does not depend on only two atoms, but from the environment. So we can, uh, we can have a sort of inaccuracy in the calculation of the potential mean force. And this is how, uh, basically how the uh, knowledge base uh, works. So, uh, once we have seen about the search algorithm and the scoring function, what to know about the docking softwares? The proper docking software should be, uh, should have a lot of sensitivity and they could, they have to be uh, also adaptable to additional scoring functions if maybe we want it, if we want to add additional scoring functions, they have to be uh, adaptivity, and then they have to have the ability to refine the docking parameters. Then they have to be quite quick, so in the calculations, and they possibly the use of uh, uh, graphical user interface and the um, formation of in a uh, proper input-output uh, structural file is to be preferred. And also the code is, should be uh, available freely, basically, uh, or it could be upgraded when possible. So this is a list of 
main uh, docking software that are uh, used uh, with uh, uh, their main difference and their availability. Some of them are commercial, while uh, s them, some of them, uh, as Vina and Autodoc, are free to use. So let's start uh, to see better the Autodoc, and uh, specifically the Autodoc suite, uh, because later we will uh, have a, a tutorial with, uh, by using both Autodoc and Autodoc Venus, so let's see uh, better how they work. Basically, both Autodoc and Autodoc Vina are uh, um, included in the Autodoc suite, which is a free open source um, that uh, basically is uh, uh, included both complementary docking engines and tools and methods. Um, among the docking engines, we will have Autodoc 4, Autodoc Vina, the, and the new Autodoc uh, FR for the docking with the flexible receptor, and this last uh, um, uh, docking algorithm to dock uh, peptides. And uh, then instead, what uh, uh, about the tools? We the ADT, so the Autodoc suite, is uh, basically formed by the graphical user interface. In particular, we will use today the Autodoc tools rather, but we also have the Raccoon too, that is a, a user interface uh, uh, that we can use for the virtual screening with Autodoc. Um, then we have also uh, specific docking, docking methods able to perform the, also the covalent docking. And uh, uh, also we, uh, within the Autodoc suite, uh, we have also two main tools that are able to predict uh, the active site, specifically auto ligand, but we can also, we will also run auto grid to generate the, the, the maps, the grid maps. So let's see briefly what about Autodoc, some, some uh, basically principle of Autodoc. Autodoc uh, is probably one of the most used docking software. Its main advantage is that it's free to use. And uh, um, with respect to the first version of Autodoc, now we have uh, a quite a new version that uh, in which we have implemented some, uh, um, some other functionalities. And uh, we have the last version of Autodoc is Autodoc GPU that was uh, introduced uh, re very recently and in which we can run the Autodoc engine we even, if, uh, even with uh, the C GPU uh, instead of CPU code. So, uh, and so it is uh, quite uh, faster. Uh, so, let's see how does uh, Autodoc treat the receptor. The first thing is to uh, use Autogrid, because Autodoc is, um, when we want to use Autodoc, it is necessary, necessary to pre-calculate the atomic affinity of the ligand with its target, and then we will use the Autogrid uh, uh, the autogrid function. In using the autogrid function, we will uh, first of all uh, define the grid box around uh, the, the binding sites. My, my suggestion is to uh, try to locate the center of the grid box somehow at, you know, at near at the center of mass of the ligand and the uh, make wide enough in order to let all the ligand to be moved. So not so small, but even not so bigger, because otherwise we will have a position, a configuration of the ligands even out of the binding site, and it is not we want to do. So the first thing is to locate the grid box, as I said. Then once we have defined uh, both the grid sides, the grid box sides, and the uh, coordinates, 
as I said, uh, very close to the ligand center of mass. Uh, then we can run autogrid, and autogrid we will uh, run, we will pre-calculate the interaction energy maps for each atom type of the ligand, we will calculate a map, an interaction map with the receptor. Okay? In addition, with autogrid we will obtain also electrostatic potential and uh, the solvation free energy grid maps, because uh, as, I said, as I said before, autodoc is based on the force field scoring function that has in their equation also the dissolvation term. And with this kind of uh, um, run, we will calculate also the dissolvation uh, term. And then we, can, we will uh, have uh, files with the uh, extension point map uh, in which, uh, uh, we, in which uh, all the grids are, will be described. Uh, we can uh, uh, also run autogrid by command line, that is much faster. As I said before, the general rule is to make the grid volume not so small, but not so big, so sh large enough to uh, allow the ligand to change the conformation. How does Autodoc treat instead the ligand? As I said before, uh, Autodoc is uh, uh, based on the genetic algorithms, but uh, um, we can uh, divide uh, the. Uh, we can in the, in the last version of Autodoc we will uh, um, use uh, an, an uh, improved version of the conformational search, which is the Lamarckian gen genetic algorithm, which is an hybrid research algorithm methods in which that uh, derives from the local search method, uh, which is the solids and vets, but it, it is um, also known as uh, uh, simulated annealing, and uh, the genetic algorithm, which is the improvement of using uh, the hybrid search method with respect to the genetic algorithm alone. We can see it here. As we can see in the genetic algorithm, we can generate for each parent configuration, we can generate uh, children configurations by looking at as um, uh, we can compare the generation of the uh, children conformation um, by comparing it with the Mendelian uh, genetic theory. And uh, when we implement the genetic algorithm with the Lamarckian genetic algorithm, uh, we can see that for each children configuration, we can perform a local search method. So we will have higher probability to reach in the conform conformational generation of the ligand the global minimum okay, of the ligand conformations, what it cannot be reached with the genetic algorithm alone. So it is uh, quite a good improvement in the new version of, uh, of Autodoc. Obviously, um, how many iterations step we, do we have to do for each ligand? It depends on the number of rotatable bonds because more, the more rotatable bonds in the ligand, more difficult will be to find good binding modes. So my suggestion is to run a lot of uh, uh, conformation of the ligand as much higher are the rotatable bonds of the ligand, so we could have uh, the higher probability to reach the global minimum. So let's uh, have a look at the docking parameter file. The docking parameter file is the uh, main uh, file which, uh, from which we can run the, the autodoc. So it is divided into several, um, into several uh, sections. Here we will have the ligand, uh, the parameter defining uh, the ligand type, atom type, and then uh, the maps that were calculated by autogrid for each type of the ligand. Here we will have the name of the ligand, the coordinates, 
the uh, initial coordinates of the configuration, legal configuration. This is a sort of RMSD uh, deviation tolerance because uh, Outdoc performs cluster analysis interna internally. Then we will have here parameters considering uh, the uh, search algorithm. Here, even this, all this parameter that starts with GA, let's see that we will run genetic algorithms. Then when we combine genetic algorithms, algorithms with local search, so solid vets, we will use also <coughs> local search. So when both of them are explicitly defined in the docking parameter file, this we will means that we will run a Lamarckian genetic algorithm search. So this run, when we will have this kind of terms, this means an both this kind of uh, uh, search algorithm are explicitly in the uh, docking parameter file, we will run the Lamarckian genetic algorithm. Uh, how does uh, work, uh, Autodoc works with the complex? Uh, I said before that it calculates uh, the, it, it used uh, uh, the force field based, but it also can be uh, called as semi empirical because. Uh, um, in addition, we can treat also the hydrogen bond um, uh, interactions terms. So, uh, for this kind of reason, it, the, the scoring function of Autodoc can be known also as uh, semi empirical. Uh, what about Autodoc Vina instead? Autodoc Vina works in a different way because it uses the knowledge based. Uh, um, and also, <coughs> and uh, uh, it has uh, very improvements with respect to Autodoc, specifically the, the accuracy is uh, more accurate. It is, um, it is able to, uh, um, to experimentally reproduce the, 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 the binding conformation, the experimental conformation, even when uh, the, rotate, the number of the rotatable bonds of the ligand are higher, also is much more faster. The search algorithm is different because it uses Monte Carlo with the additional uh, the Bryden Fletcher Goldfarsano effects, uh, that is uh, another type of stochastic ser search algorithm. Uh, then uh, uh, it used the hybrid scoring function because it is uh, based on the knowledge base plus the empirical. And uh, differently from Autodoc, in which we have to run the autogrid separately, in Vina the grid maps are calculated internally, so we have not to define. Uh, we have not to define uh, to run auto grid, okay? Uh, so basically, this is how Vina uh, makes the conformational search. So starting from the configurational, the starting configurational, it uh, performs uh, a global opt optimization of the ligand to have the second conformation, and then for the second conformation, it starts uh, a local conformation, and then it refines the conformation using the metropolis acceptance uh, check so uh, and it takes into account also the um, in the uh, conformation the ranking of the conformational ligand and then basically we this is how we will do uh, later uh, so in, in the tutorial we will um, um, perform this basic this kind of workflow first of all we have to treat we will treat uh, the enzyme in our case we will have the um, cyclooxygenate isoforms and uh, basically we will treat separately also the ligand so we will uh, perform also conformational search of the ligand uh, within the within the binding site so we will define all the flexible or rigid bonds, which bonds are rotatable and which not. And then we will run both Autodoc Vina and Autodoc, and we will see, we will perform the analysis of the docking, docking outcomes. Yes? When we were trying docking in some maybe educational environment, the 
many parts of the workflow, workflow uh, than by hand. Uh, my question is, in real workflow, when you do the study, is it really that pretty much all the work is done by hand, or is there like a scripted environment when even those definitions of flexible and rigid bonds could be done by by software? Okay, you can uh, you can yeah. Um, when uh, we use Autodoc, but also Autodoc Vina, within the Autodoc suite, uh, we will have also a sort of script, Python script, that performs all the analysis, okay, of this kind of analysis. We have uh, Python script for the generation of the proper input file uh, and to define, um, you know, uh, the... Um, um, the, to define the best ranked uh, conformations, to treat uh, separately uh, each conformation and uh, have uh, the res ranked results. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of uh, Python script uh, within uh, the Autodoc suite. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. In, in the tutorial, we will use the um, graphical user interface. But the same thing with the same results can be done with the uh, command line and also with those Python script. If, we work, if you work with, uh, with Linux operating system, um, you can see uh, the, the path where such kind of uh, Python scripts are located. So it, it is even simple, I think more simple to use Python script in a Linux system win instead of a Windows one. So, but the, the results are exactly the same. Yeah. So, may I finish? There are questions. Thank you. Yes. Okay, okay. This is a uh, quite uh, good questions. Uh, basically, I um, I use uh, I, I work with uh, the uh, Schrodinger suite. That it helps to um, uh, to protonate ligands, uh, even when you are you have a lot of ligands. But uh, the same thing. And I think uh, uh, even more useful is to use, uh, for instance, chem sketch, because in the chem sketch you can see uh, the protonation state of the ligand uh, and given pH, and then uh, you can um, add uh, manually the the proton you have or the the charge, the molecular charge. So you can modify it also with. Uh, Chem sketch or a Marvin sketch, something like that. Okay, so if there are no questions, so we'll let's. Okay. Sorry? To protonate the ligand? Um, open source uh, docking software. Uh, I work a lot with Autodoc and Autodoc Vina. And I has had in my in my works I had uh, very good results. Uh, I didn't complain anything about Autodoc Vina or Autodoc. So I think uh, as uh, open source docking software they are, uh, at least for me, my opinion, they are um, probably the, the best, uh, uh, one of the best talking algorithm. Yeah. I work a lot with them. Okay. So, let's see later for the tutorial. Is that okay? And uh, now 
as yesterday, the lunch is waiting for you outside. And uh, we will start with lecture.